Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to this special broadcast where I've been going through Gipp's Understandable History of the Bible book by Samuel C. Gipp. And today we're going to continue through uh, the chapter 9, the authorized version, and we're going to uh, continue where we left off last time, and whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. And uh, the pat page number for the book I have, the copy I have, is uh, page 311. And we're going to start with... Um, um, uh, part four, and this is the second Westminster Company. Make sure I got that right, that part there. Um, so let me go back here. <clears throat> yep, so part four, and this is uh, continuing on in this book. Hold on a second, let me try to straighten that up for you. All right, <clears throat> scoot this away a little bit. All right, so, all right, so this is again from Gibbs' Understandable History of the Bible book. And chapter 9, the authorized version, and this will be part 5, starting on page 311 with uh, part 4 in this uh, topic here on the different men who wrote the um, the uh, English Bible, the King James Bible, the translators. And so here we go with uh, the Second Westminster Company. It says this group also contains seven men. They translated Romans to Jude. So that's what they were uh, translated. So the first one, the first man mentioned here from this company is, excuse me, uh, William uh, Barlow. And he lived from 15 question mark to 1613. And it says here about um, um, William Barlow. And it says Dr. Barlow <clears throat> was prebendary of Westminster, 1603, and Dean of Chester, at the beginning of the translation, then he later became Bishop of uh, Rochester in 1605, and lastly, Bishop of Lincoln in 1608. He was one of the learned divines selected for the conference at Hampton Court. <coughs> <clears throat> he is responsible for recording all the transpired... Um, so it says here is responsible for recording all that tr that transpired during that conference and for observations connected with it. Next we have Ralph uh, Hutch, Hutchinson, uh, pronounced Hutch and Eason. Um, it's uh, spelt two different ways, or the way it's spelt is H-U-T-C-H-I-N-S-O-N, but it's um, uh, parentheses here, it's H-U-T-C-H-E-S-O-N, so Hutchinson. And he lived from 1553 to 1606. And it says, Dr. Hutchinson was president of St. John's College, Oxford, 1590. And John Boyce notes of the workings of the translation, he is referred to as Hutch. Hmm. Next we have John Spencer, 1559 to 1614. Dr. Spencer was vicar of Al Alverley. 1589, Vicar of Bronxbourne, 1592, Vicar of St. Sepulchres, uh, 1599, President of Corpus Christi College, 1607, and finally, uh, Prebendary of St. Paul's in 1612. Next we have Roger Fenton <coughs> uh, from this group, <coughs> 1567 to 1617. Dr. Fenton was Fellow of Pembroke Hall, Cambridge, Vicar of Chigwell, uh, 1606, Prebendary of St. Paul's, 1609, and finally, Vicar of St. Stephen's, Walbrook. Next is uh, Michael uh, Rabbit, um, 15 uh, question mark to 16 question mark. And Dr. Rabbit was the Rector of St. Vidust. Forest Lane, London. Next we have Thomas Sanderson, 15 question mark to 16 question mark. Uh, it is thought that this is the Sanderson who was Archdeacon of Rochester in 1606. And then finally in this group we have William Dakins, <clears throat> 1567 to 1606. William Dakins was vicar of Trumpington. 1603, and then appointed Professor of Divinity 
in Grisham College in 1604, <coughs> he was employed in this work for his great uh, knowledge of the original languages. <coughs> All right, now we move on to uh, part five in this topic of these different men and these different companies, uh, the translators, uh, with the second Oxford company. This group consisted of 11 men. They translated the four Gospels, Acts of the Apostles, and the Revelation. So here we go. These 11 men, Thomas Revis, 1560-1609. Dr. Revis was rector of All Hallows, Bar Barking, 1591, canon of Westminster, 1592. Deacon of Christ Church, 1596. Bishop of Gloucestershire, 1605, and lastly, Bishop of London in 1607. He was famous for his eminent learning, gravity, and prudence. Next is George Abbott, 1562 to 1633. Dr. Abbott was minister, or was master, excuse me, Dr. Abbott was master of University College, Oxford, 1597. Dean of Winchester, 1600. Bishop of Co Coventry and Litchfield, 1609, and Archbishop of Canterbury in 1612. Next is Richard Edes, E-E-E-D-E-S, uh, 1555 to 1604. Dr. Edes was prebendary of S Salisbury, 1584, prebendary of Hereford, uh, 1590. Queen's Chaplain and Dean of Worcestershire in 1596. He was greatly admired for his preaching as well as his discourse, which was said to be both excellent and polite. He died in November 1604, soon after the translation was begun. Hmm. <coughs> oh, excuse me. All right, next is uh, Giles or Giles. Tom Thompson, 1553 to 1612. Dr. Thompson was fellow of All Souls, Queen's Chaplain, Rector of Pembroke, uh, Herefordshire, Dean of Windor, or Windsor, uh, so Dean of Windsor, uh, 1602, and Bishop of Gloucestershire in 1611. Dr. Thompson died in 1612 to the great grief of all that knew the piety and learning of the man after he had taken a great deal of pains at the command of King James in translating the four Gospels, <coughs> Acts of the Apostles, and Apocalypse. He was loved for being brief, learned, and discreet. Next is Henry Seville, 1549-1622. Dr. Seville was fellow of Merton, 1565, was warden of Merton, 1585, and pr provost of e Eton in 1596. He was knighted in 1604. He founded the Seville prof Professorships of Geometry and Ost Astronomy at Oxford. Dr. Seville was known for his Greek and mathematical learning, he was so well known for his education skill, his education skill with languages and knowledge of the word that he became Greek and mathematical tutor to Queen Elizabeth during the reign of her father, Henry the Eighth, and that's an Ibid page one sixty five. <coughs> now wait, don't read over the statement that statement so fast. He says, so he says. Now wait, don't read over. That statement so fast, this man was recognized as such a learned man that he was the one, the only one, chosen to tutor the future Queen of England. Is the academic stature of the King James translators finally starting to dawn on you? A question mark. Can you see the abject shallowness of the best that scholarship has to offer today? Question. Uh, and he puts in parentheses, it must gall men like James White to realize the great gap between them and real intellect. 
right? Mm. Furthermore, Dr. Uh, McClure tells us he is chiefly known, however, by being the first to edit the complete works of John uh, Chrysostom, the famous of the Greek fathers, and that's Ibid, page 166. All right, next we have John Perrin, or, per, or Perny, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, I guess it's P-E-R-N-E -E is the parentheses, so I guess it's pronounced Pern, Perny, or Pern, uh, maybe the E's silent, so it's, so how they spell it here is uh, P-E-R-I-N, and then in parentheses it's P-E-R-N-E, -E, so I guess that's how you pronounce it, is per, Pern, or Perny, John Pern, uh, so, uh, 15 question mark to 1615 it says fellow of st john's college 1575 regis professor of greek he resigned this post to work on the bible translation later vicar of wafting and suex um, and afterwards canon of christ church um, i think that's Su susex s-u-s-s-e-x uh, and afterwards, Canon of uh, Christ Church. Next, we have Ralph Ravens, 15, question mark, to 1615. Dr. Ravens was vicar of Easton Magna in Essex. Um, also, there was a person of this name of Queen's College, <laughs> M.A., in 1595, and sub-dean of Wells in 1607. Next is John Harmar. 15 question mark to 1613. Dr. Harmar was fellow of New College, 1574, Regis Professor of Greek, 1585, and Warden of Winchester College in 1596. He was a most noted Latinist, Grecian, and divine. He translated Beza's sermons into English. Hmm. Uh, next is Leonard Hutton. 1557 to 1632, Dr. Hutton was vicar of Flor, uh, 1601, and presbytery of St. Paul, 1609. Then we have John El Elgin, then by, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, A-G-L-I-O-N-B-Y, Elgin, 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 by, uh, 1566 to 1609. A royal chaplain, principal of St. Edmund Hall, Oxford, it is believed that Dr. Elgenby, Elgenby, of course the could, so we'll just say John, uh, so John uh, was appointed to the translation committee to replace Dr. Eads, who died soon after the work began in 1604, and again I apologize if I'm pronouncing any of these names wrong, but trying the best I can, so amen. <laughs> <coughs> All right, next we have, and finally we have from this group, James uh, Montague. James Montague. And it's spelled M-O-U-N-T-A-G-U-E. And then in parentheses they pronounce it, or spell it, M-O-N-T-A-G-U. So, Montague. 1568-1618, and it says Dr. Montague was first master of Puritan Sydney Su Sussex College, Cambridge, 1595, Dean of Lin Lynchfield, 1603, Dean of Worcestershire, 1604, Bishop of Bath and Wells, 1608, Bishop of Winchester, uh, 1616, Edited and translated the works of King James I, 1616. Uh, there is some question as to Montague's, Montague's participation. So there's some question about that. All right, next we have um, uh, part five, <laughs> the second Cambridge company. This final group consisted of seven. It was their job to translate the Apocrypha. So we know that... The Apocrypha is taken out of the Bible, but they were the ones that were uh, translated the Apocrypha. <clears throat> so, um, first we have John Duport, 15 question mark to 1617. 
uh, John Duport was rector of Fulham, uh, 1583, pre pres uh, pres presenter of St. Paul's, 1585, master of Jesus College, 1590, and presbytery of Eli in 1609. And we have William uh, Brothwitty, B-R-A-N-T-H, W-A-I-T-E. So he lived from 15, uh, question mark, to 1620. So Dr. Branson Witty was found, founding fellow of Emanuel College, 1584, and master of Gonville and Cautious College, C-A-I-O-S, I-U-S, C-A-I-U-S, College, Cambridge, 1607, and Anabaptist, or, excuse me, Anabaptist, Anti-Papist. So, I don't know why I was thinking Anabaptist. It's because of the other book I was reading. So it says he was an anti-Papist. Well, Brantha Whitty was added to the translation committee to replace a suspected Roman Catholic spy who was dismissed. Hmm. Next we have Jeremiah Radcliffe. He lived from 15 question mark to 1612. Jeremiah Radcliffe was fellow of the Trini of Trinity College, Cambridge, a vicar of Evesham, 1588, rector of Orwell, 1590, and vice master of Trinity College in 1597. And then we have Samuel Ward, 15 question mark to 1643. Samuel Ward, another Puritan, was a friend and correspondent of Archbishop Usher. He was found, or excuse me, he was fellow of Emmanuel, 1595, master of Sydney Sussex College, uh, Cambridge, 1610, King's Chaplain, 1611, uh, Archdeacon of Taunton, 1615, Prebendary of Wells, 1615, Prebendary of York, 1618, and Lady Margaret's Professor of Divinity in Cambridge in 1623. He is famous for his diversified learning, yet more especially pertaining to biblical and oriental criticism. And then we have Andrew Dows, or Downs, D-A... I don't keep... I apologize that my reading is so bad tonight, <laughs> but uh, trying to get through these names as best as I can and pronouncing them. All right, so uh, Andrew Downs, D-O-W-N-E-S, 1549-1628. Dr. Downs was Regis, professor of Greek, Cambridge, 1585, and was sent from that university with <coughs> boys uh, who had been his scholar to join a new selection of revisers from the whole number of the translators. He and boys worked together with Sir, S Sir Henry uh, Seville on publishing the works of Ch Chrysostom, C-H-R-Y-S-O-S-T-O-M, uh, Chrysostom, and then we have John Boys, 1561-1644. Dr. Boys was the Greek uh, lecturer at Cambridge, uh, 1584 to, er, in 1584, and presbytery of Eli in 1615. He was considered one of the finest Greek scholars in the kingdom, and was extremely well acquainted with the Hebrew language, of which he was acquired. <coughs> excuse me, of which he had acquired the knowledge at a very young, or er, er, very early age. Young John had read completely through the Bible by the age of five, <laughs> wow, and at six years old was writing freely in Hebrew. He was the author of a work much esteemed by scholars entitled, I ain't even going to say all this because it's just all in another language and I'm not even going to bother, so you can look it up if you have a copy of this book, so I will try the best I can, but... We'll, we'll just go through this and then skip over it. Um, so it's entitled, Viteris Interpretis Cum Biza 
Alice Quay, Rick Center Bus, Colatio in Quetura, Evangelist in It, Impostor Rurium, Actus and C. I was trying to act like, you know, I was somebody, you know, trying to read that. You know, oh, oh, we gotta, gotta read the whatever this language is, but even though I can't pronounce any of it, sorry. <laughs> Um, anyway, moving on, um, can't just put it in English, um, so anyway, um, so this was published after his death in 1655, there were his, these were his Latin notes on the four Gospels and Acts, he wrote notes also upon, uh, Churchstum, uh, which Sir Henry Seville must, uh, much esteemed and used in his edition of the works of that father, Boyce, and his critical labors, labors are often mentioned in Archbishop Usher's letters. He was said to be second to none in his knowledge of the Greek language. So, <clears throat> all right. Next, we have Robert Ward, fifteen question mark to sixteen question mark. He was fellow of King's College, Cambridge, Presbytery of. Ch Chinchester and rector of Bishop's uh, Waltham um, in Hamps Hampshire. All right, so okay, so there's the end of that. And uh, next page uh, it says these are the men who were on the translation committees who died before the work was completed. So these are the men who died before the work com was completed. Number one, we have Richard Edes, 1604. Second, we have Edward Lively, 1605. Next is uh, three, number three, so one, two, three. Uh, Ralph Hutchinson, 1606. Four is William Dakins, 1606. Uh, five is John Reynolds, 1607. Six is Thomas Revis, 1609. And then uh, seven is John Al Algon Levi. Um, 1609. <coughs> <clears throat> Alright, um, so continuing on, it says, We could go on concerning the tremendous scholarship of the King James translators, but we have not the space here, um, Brother Gibbs says. Dr. McClure's book, uh, Translators Revi Revived, is recommended for an in-depth study of the lives of these men. So that's where this where all this uh, information comes from is from this book, Translators Revived, from uh, Dr. McClure's book here. Um, so, amen. All right, next uh, he says here, it should be noted that these men were qualified in the readings of the church fathers, which prevented them from being bound to the manuscripts, which many times causes earlier readings to be overlooked. This is vastly better than the methods used by modern translators it should be it should also be recognized that these men did not live in ivory towers right they were men who were just as renowned for their preaching ability as they were for their esteemed education it is a lesson in humility to see men of sat of such great spiritual stature call themselves poor instruments to make god's holy truth to be yet more and more known. Amen. <clears throat> so, let's see here. All right, so next we'll move on to uh, the rules for translating the authorized version. So these are the rules, and it says here, following are the rules set down for the translators to follow in, their, in doing their work. So, number one, the ordinary Bible read in the church commonly called the bishop's bible to be followed and as little altered as the original will permit number two the names of the prophets and the holy writers with the other names in the text to be retained as near as it may be accordingly as they are vulgarly used number three the old ecclesiastical words to be kept as the word church not be translated con uh, congregation. So again, the old ecclesiastical words to be kept 
as the word church, not to be translated congregation, number four, when any word hath divers sig significations, that to be kept, which hath been more commonly used by the most eminent fathers, being agreeable to the propriety or of the place in the analogy of, of faith, number five, the division of the chapters to be altered either not at all or as little as may be if necessary if necess necessity so require number six no marginal notes at all to be affixed but only for the explanation of the hebrew or greek words which cannot without some circumlocution uh, so briefly and fitly be expressed in the text. Number seven, such quotations of places to be marginally set down as shall serve for the fit references of one scripture to another. Uh, number eight, every particular man of each company to take the same chapter or chapters and having translated or amended them se severe severally uh, by himself when he thinks good all to meet together to confer what they have done and agree for their part what shall stand number nine as any one company hath dispatched any one book in this manner they shall send it to the rest to be considered of seriously and judiciously for his majesty is very careful in this point number ten if any company, upon the review of the book is so sent, shall doubt or differ upon any places, to send them a word thereof, to note the places, and therewithal to send their reasons, to which, if they consent not, the difference uh, to be compounded at the general meeting, which is to be of the chief persons of each company at the end of the work. Number 11 when any place of special obscurity is doubted of letters to be directed by authority uh, to send to any learned in the land for his judgment in such a place number 12 uh, letters to be sent from every bishop to the rest of his clergy admonishing them of this translation in hand and to move and charge as many as being skillful in the tongues have taken pains in that kind to send their particular observations to the company, either at uh, Westminster, Cambridge, or Oxford, according as it was directed before in the King's letter to the Archbishop. Number 13, the directors in which, or excuse me, the directors in each company to be the deans of Westminster and Chester for uh, Westminster, um, so again, the directors in each company to be the deans of Westminster and Chester for Westminster and the king's professors in Hebrew and Greek in the two universities. Number 14, these translations to be used when they agree better uh, with the text than the bishop's Bible, uh, viz. Tyndale's, Coverdale's, Matthew's, uh, White Church's, and Geneva. And number 15, beside the uh, said directors <clears throat> before mentioned, three or four of the most ancient and grave divines in either of the universities not employed in translating to be assigned by the vice chancellor upon conference with the rest of the heads to be overseers of the translation as well, Hebrew as Greek, for the the better observation of the fourth rule above specified. So those are the 14 rules. Amen. And you can also look them up <clears throat> on your own and get a copy of that. Um, if you don't have a copy of the book. All right. Next uh, topic is reviewing the work. Uh, when one company finished its work, the finished product was reviewed within the co that committee then it was sent to each and every other committee to be reviewed again and altered if necessary 
by the input of the entire body of the translators, then learned men from all over the empire who had not been included among the translators were sent letters inviting them to review the work also. In this manner no mind was ignored, no talent wasted, but the work was still not finished. After the completed translation was reviewed by any qualified man within the kingdom, it was reviewed by a final board of six of the original translators and then sent to the printer. Next is the materials. After the translators were decided on, the materials used for the work itself were gathered. Uh, and then it says, so they were gathered. Uh, England had a wealth of such sources due to its newfound prominence. The King James translators had both Hebrew and Greek witnesses. For Greek, they had the text of Erasmus, Biza, and Stephanus. Uh, the, these they checked against versions in Latin, um, Syrian, Chaldean, Spanish, French, Dutch, and Italian. They even had access to a Doi Rheims English translation for the sake of comparison. Uh, there had been, had never been, nor has ever been, an undertaking of such magnitude, and it was carried out with a precision that history testifies was perfect. Amen. <clears throat> and then finally we got the physical layout, and it says, because it was valued as a history rather than scripture, the Apocrypha was placed between the Testaments rather than scattered within the text in Roman Catholic tradition. Words added by the translators were put in italics, as had been done in translation before the King James. The chapters and verses were divided in accordance with the system used in the latest Geneva Bible. The type used to its de detriment today was Gothic rather than the easier to read Roman. Uh, when it was finally completed, copies were sent to the royal presses at Oxford and Cambridge, and in 1611 the world had the perfect words of God in English. Uh, thus we see that the King James Bible had the highest caliber of men working on it with a wide field of text and versions and was checked and rechecked for accuracy of translation. The work took seven years to complete and has never been surpassed. Now compare the qualifications of the King James translators to those of our modern era. <clears throat> Amen. So... And that's where we'll leave off uh, with that. And next time we'll pick up with uh, the subtopic -top title, Revised Scholarship. So and that will be on page 321 in this copy that I have, the third edition. So amen. All right. So we'll pick up there next time. Amen. And again, this is the cover of the book. I know it's backwards on the screen, but that's the cover of the copy I have, the third edition. <coughs> I know he's done another one since then, so amen. All right, well, that'll be it for today, so thanks for watching, and may the Lord richly bless you until next time. And again, apologize for any uh, names I mispronounced and some of the stuff I was having a hard time reading and pronouncing, so did the best I can, so praise the Lord. Amen, and if you want to get a copy and try to read it yourself and, and pronounce those names yourself on your own time, uh, uh, amen. <laughs> so, all right, so that'll be it. So, um, see you all next time. Bye-bye for now.